What is up fellow hosts and humans, welcome to another Westworld Season 4, Episode 3, Recap, Breakdown, and Review. Now today's episode really, really, as I always say, I'm sorry every single week, but it is. It's very interesting, especially now that we've picked up with Bernard post-Sublime, or should I say Valley Beyond, as he's now kind of a prophet. We've got very interesting developments with Caleb's family and Caleb and Maeve themselves with regards to investigating what the heck Holoris is up to, and we've got quite a few more clues with the flies. Quite a bit to talk about today, guys. As usual, I want to dive straight into it, but I read every single comment, so can't wait to see what you guys have to say. So first of all, I really liked how this episode picked up because we were somewhat seeing Bernard's own world, if you will, within that of the sublime. The first words we heard were from Arnold's son, Dad, open your eyes. Because after all, even though Bernard isn't Arnold, he, he somewhat is a reflection in a way, so he does have that inbuilt sentimentality there for Arnold's former life. And as explained by Akicheta, I hope I pronounced that correctly, I always mess that name up, but he explained Bernard as per what we saw, he's reliving his life, so of course we saw the Westworld bar, the dead bodies there, We I believe we even saw the riots at the end of last season. We see him go in the building, and there before him is is uh, Akicheta, who God knows how many lifetimes he has had by now, to the point of where he, he kind of seems omniscient, if you know what I mean. Like, he is just all-knowing. And, and they technically are, because it's like they've built their own... Well, I don't know if you would say they've built it, but they have their own Rehoboam, in a way, with regards to what happens to allow Bernard to evolve into Prophet Bernard. Obviously, with the letterbox aspect ratio, if you will, this is, you know, showing that it's not in the real world. They're very much so in Bernard's world right now. Everyone else who entered the Sublime are in worlds of their own choosing. It's like they're gods of their own existence, truly. Bernard explains that he wants to help the outside world there, and we have Akacheta basically saying, it's irrational, you know, a rare flaw in ones like us. Basically acknowledging that, you know, you're a host, why why would you really kind of care about what happens to them? He asks if he'll come with him, but this is where we get like a really cool explanation from Akacheta saying, you know, my, I don't know man, my own world's cool to me. It's just like, oh god, like, is he like a god of like, god knows how many worlds that he takes care of and the people or whatever creations he has within it. But he says that he can give him a gift and this is where the mini Rehoboam explanation comes in. And that is, in the real world you could say, time is a straight line. When you're there, it's essentially a, a millennium in here, which is why Akicheta and, and even if we saw other hosts, they would they seem like something else now. They've almost transcended and are almost otherworldly in a way, in their demeanor. And in that time, it's been around, as we said, a millennia. They've basically built many worlds, models of possibilities, simulations of all the possible paths that the real world could take, which is, again, basically Rehoboam. Not using it to dictate lives, but just to simply predict. Akicheta suggests that Bernard explores them, and since he's a host, I was thinking, wouldn't that take ages? But then, basically, we saw Bernard blip into all kinds of different cuts of the dust of the real world, all these essential possibilities, and he can sift through them because at the end of the day, a host processing unit is much faster than our brains. So he essentially did what Doctor Strange did in Infinity War with looking at every possibility and seeing the one outcome, more or less, that will avoid destruction. Interestingly, Akicheta in this moment says you, you must be quick because with all of these possibilities, at some point soon, past a certain point in your world, all paths will end in destruction. So if you don't get onto it soon, Bernard, no matter what you do, you have, you have to intervene before that certain point to ensure survival of the human race. After sifting through all that, he says to Akicheta, oh yeah, I, I've seen the path. The thing is, in every scenario, I die. But Bernard being Bernard still wants to assert this survival possibility, even if it means his death. And so Bernard wakes up, it is dusty as hell. I do want to point out, please correct me if I'm wrong with anything by the way, but they never point out the time where Stubbs and Bernard is in. It, it, we don't know if it's strictly in the same time as Caleb and Maeve, which is eight years after the end of the finale of season three. To me, it feels as though this is well beyond eight years. Maybe not like, you know, I'm talking decades or anything, but maybe enough years to the point of where Frankie, Caleb's daughter, would have grown up into a grown-ass adult. 
if you see what I'm saying there, because I think there could be a certain character these two bump into that could be that very person. I could be wrong, but of course, this is Westworld Breakdown, so like, we're, we're chucking in some theories there. Again, I absolutely love Prophet Bernard, because in this moment, he's finishing Stubbs' sentence. He says that sometimes you make a joke about not getting a postcard, but this time, it was about not bringing back a snow globe from the sublime. As he says in this moment, good, I've eliminated half the possibilities with regards to that. So in a similar analogy to like, you know, whether it's Infinity War or Endgame, if you will, when we're talking about storylines like this, I guess the idea is that he knows most likely, you know, the very possibility as what we've already had set up, that he knows the path, but he does kind of have to still try and ensure that happening. It, almost like he's a moderator of this timeline. He has to kind of make sure certain events happen in a certain way in order to save the world. And as a result, for example, with this snow globe moment with Stubbs, the fact that he did say the line of the snow globe instead of the postcard. Bottom line, now that he said that, Bernard can now get rid of every other timeline or possibility that would have ended in destruction maybe in where Stubbs said about the postcard, if you're still with me. So it, it's not really really complicated, but the more you talk about it, the, the more complicated it sounds. The only thing I'm apprehensive about in a very critical perspective is usually storylines like this in a writing way can really go south very quickly. They're very fascinating. It's a similar thing with time travel and whatnot. I love stuff like that in shows or movies, but the writing is uh, usually flawed in the execution. So again, I'm a big fan of this, but also apprehensive of, oh, okay, so this kind of doesn't make sense potentially at some point down the line. Again, we get some more funny moments where Prophet Bernard says a prophet line. It's like, oh yeah, you know, the shovel and Stubbs gets the shovel. Now, the answer to the shovel wasn't given in this episode, but stay around towards the end of this episode where we basically somewhat get a hint as to how that shovel gets used in the next episode. It's kind of obvious, so maybe some of you have guessed it, but again, promo breakdown at the end. So in this moment as well, Stubbs settles for the tuna. He tries to order something else but again very cleverly Bernard knew that he would try and order something else it's not really cleverly he just knew it because he's seen it and she says we've run out of that so we have tuna so he had to therefore settle for the tuna meal this is where Bernard goes outside because he's been eyeing up these guys at the the bar if you will who were waiting for a certain character and he needed to do this because as we saw he drags the bodies and what happens later let's just say he wants some proof of a little host control unit that is in one of their heads to show to another character. But before we revisit that storyline, let's go to Caleb and Maeve into the world of the Roaring Twenties, which as we know has been somewhat, you know, reseated onto Sweetwater, down to the point of where, I know it's the Twenties, but they've, they've, you know, as they say in the behind the scenes, a lot of knockoffs, down to the very characters as we see as they're exploring it. Caleb almost picks up the jar that Dolores usually drops and Teddy picks up. We even have the knockoff Dolores Dolores knock off Teddy. But this is where they go into the Butterfly Club, akin to the Mariposa from Sweetwater, I believe. That was even a translation to the Butterfly Club. So again, just reinforcing how everything really is the same. And then guys, this is where we, I wanna talk about the Caleb family side of things. And we have Frankie trying to radio dad. Does this remind you of anyone that we may have seen in a certain Bernard and Stubbs storyline? But anyway, going forward before we really dig into that side of things, as we know from last episode towards the end, Caleb wanted his family out of there. So one of his military guys, I believe he was named Carver, was helping them pack to leave this episode. In this moment, we had him say that, oh, you know, I'll teach Bear Bear a special move. And that's when we pick up a little bit later and Frankie asks, okay, so what move did you teach Bear Bear? He's like, what, what, what do you mean a move? He's like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll show you at the safe house. And, and she looks at the bear and it's got blood on it. Then Frankie notices some blood drops on the floor and finds the real body. And this is where obviously a host has infiltrated the family. She rushes to mum, tells her, and this is where they realize, well, crap, we, we kind of need to like hide and do something about this. But I'm not gonna lie, again, do correct me if I'm wrong here. It did occur to me in this moment when they started hiding, you know, we had Frankie hide in the closet and we had Carver, the host infiltrator, searching for them. What happened to Caleb's other men? When he left the house, there was more than just one dude and they all stayed behind, to my knowledge, didn't they? I, I think, to protect the family. I, I don't think Caleb would leave one military friend with the family, so I, I feel like that might be a little bit of a hole, maybe? That's my only criticism aside, I think, with regards to the other military friends, now there's just one left, 
but that's when we have Frankie shoot the guy with a BB gun as a distraction before mum freaking blew his brains out. Well, host control unit out. But back with Bernard, this is where we continue that storyline and I wanted to place it here because it's quite fitting after who we just spoke about. So Bernard says we no longer need the car anymore and he's basically just standing there waiting for someone to pick him up and Stubbs is just like, so uh, loitering in the parking lot of some shitey diner is the key to saving the world and he says no, she is. And that is when we see this woman come out of her car, a very kind of military, kind of cargo-y packed car, very, as we see with her, competently, or should I say, trained, if you will, person. And this person is referred to as C in the behind the scenes. I don't know what that stands for. But again, at this point, let's just say the name. I think this is indeed Frankie when she's grown up. I could be wrong, but I was speculating this for the past couple of episodes that from the promos, given how many clues they gave us about Frankie when she's younger, being trained and stuff, it's clear to me that somehow Frankie is going to be crucial as Caleb's daughter in, I don't know, whatever situation they have to save the world. But I'm wondering, we don't know where Caleb is in the future timeline with Bernard Stubbs and the future Frankie, or should I just say C? We don't know where Maeve is. Are they both dead? Are we going to see an old man Caleb? Some of you might think I'm getting too far ahead of myself there. Maybe you're right because this might not be Frankie, but... I don't know, this has to be Frankie, right? It's gotta be Frankie. Either way, the reason why Bernard knew to basically stand out on the road and for her to say, you know, you got a death wish, is because he's seen this path. Like, he's seen the possibility. He shows her the maze that he was drawing in the diner. He knew it would be a signal, I suppose, to the group or this resistance or whatever is going on with this group out in the desert or in the condemned lands. Bernard somewhat gains a little bit of trust because he says those two men you were supposed to meet, it was a setup, they were hosts, they've been trying to infiltrate this group that C is a part of for some time. I do wonder what it is, because even though this is the future, clearly the world hasn't ended yet. People were enjoying their coffee and stuff in this diner, but there's something that they're dedicated to stopping. And I guess they're still fighting to prevent the end of the world themselves. Maybe they are people who view themselves as the only people who are aware that the world is going to end. For now, that's my guess of what this group is, because knowing, uh, you know, the younger Frankie, she's probably trying to continue her father's mission when she's a grown-ass adult, and maybe Maeve's mission. Maybe they were successful up until a point in the past. One thing Westworld is doing, as usual this season, is keeping us on our toes with regards to, like, okay, well, it's kind of obvious that Frankie this is Frankie when she's growing up, but still, what is really going on here with other parts? And so they go out to these lands and they pass through and this is where some other members of C's slash future Frankie's group come out on quad bikes and I'm guessing that that guy who was asking the questions is the leader. He asks, how did you get this? And Bernard says, you know, they were sent to find you. You're all in danger here, but I can help you. And he asks how, by giving you the thing you're looking for in the desert, there's a weapon buried in these sands. And Bernard knows where it is. That was it as far as this storyline in this episode. I'm glad we finally got to Bernard. I'm thinking maybe, uh, I don't know if the weapon is something that was hidden a while ago that could disrupt signals from whatever Holoris is doing. If I'm wrong about that, of course the weapon could be a million other things, but who would have buried it here, right? I'm wondering if things went south with Caleb and Maeve, I could be wrong about that, but before things truly went south and before Frankie grew up into the character that we see today, who is potentially C, they buried something, which is fascinating to me. Which also makes me think, well, why did they bury it? Why didn't they use it? Why is it up to the future generation or Frankie to bring out, you know, the, the, the weapon? Why didn't they use it back in the scenes that we're seeing unfold with Maeve and Caleb? Which leads me to believe we are on the journey to seeing Caleb and Maeve locate this weapon eventually for that timeline and the scenes in the next few several episodes, if you will, unfold up until the point of where they bury it. Which is now making me think, is that flashback that we've been seeing of Caleb, you know, kind of dying maybe, 
in a somewhat similar location, maybe, maybe it wasn't a flashback, but actually his ultimate fate. I know that sounds contradictory to some of the theories already because we've seen that Maeve saw that in a, when she was meditating. We've heard references from Caleb saying, when you saved me, but they could be misleading us. And that could have been a whole different situation in the past when Caleb was saved by Maeve. And that death scene we keep seeing of Aaron Paul's Caleb, you know, with he looks like he's bleeding out, could still be the future right before or as they're burying the weapon. I could be wrong with that, but man, this is what I love about this show. It keeps me thinking. So we're back with Maeve and Caleb now, and essentially they are waiting for the excuse to be taken, or should I say the, for the Undertakers to come in. So she disrupts the narrative of the bank heist, not the bank heist, but the safe heist or whatever you want to call it, when the knockoff Hector and everything comes in. And, you know, skimming through this, they get sent down to the underground levels, if you will, but it turns out that that is still a part of the game because even the guards <laughs> were, you know, in on the game and they were hosts. Unfortunately, Maeve got shot, but we knew she was going to be fine. Interestingly, as well, to anyone who's thinking that Caleb was a host and somehow he survived the, the scene of where he was bleeding out or whatever because, I don't know, he was put into a host body or something. Well, in these moments here, he was shot with guns that don't affect humans, but Maeve was obviously wounded, so that shows that he is indeed human. Not to mention with how, at the end of this episode with the flies and what we see next episode, he, he is a human, like there's brain scans and the flies infiltrating his brain. So, again, it's leading me to think that maybe that scene of the bleeding out could be the future. And they've been, you know, kind of, you know, misdirecting us into thinking that it was the references to how he was saved in the past. And there was even a scene here where we had Caleb obviously sorting out all these other hosts. And Maeve says, oh, you handled yourself quite well out there. And he said, oh, you saved my life before. Happy to return the favor. Now, that could have been God knows how many times Maeve has saved his life. Like, literally. I mean, even like when the host was sent after his family. So it doesn't mean that it's referencing the bleeding out weird vision that we had. So, again, in this moment, they're kind of wanting you to think that, but one theory you could argue, similar to how we have in the Sublime, the hosts having built all these worlds, right? Because they're basically gods of their own universe, with finding out the possibilities of how to save the world that Bernard has now gone into the real world with, and thus he is Prophet Bernard. I am starting to have an inkling, since Maeve has always been established to be a bit more overpowered than other hosts. Maybe what we saw in her cabin when she was meditating, she had the ability to see a variation of the future as well. So this whole season, again, just to hammer it down, we've been led on to think it's the past, but really, it could have been a very brief glimpse. Maybe with, it wouldn't surprise me with Maeve's skill set and powers that it was just a possibility of Caleb, unfortunately, dying before his daughter grows up and before they hide the weapon. Let me know what you think. I'm not saying that is happening, but just wanted to chuck it out there. So up next is where we're more or less reaching the end of the episode now. And this is where we get a bit more insight into the flies. So we see Maeve and Caleb looking at these drone hosts. And as they detail in the behind the scenes, they see the drone host checking the veracity of the parasites in the Petri dishes. And then after that, putting the parasites within the black goo, if you will. And that black goo, as pointed out in the behind the scenes, is essentially the catalyst to speed up the infection, also attracting the flies in that of like a, a hormonal kind of attraction. And then the flies eat the parasite and become infected themselves. And then those flies then attack the humans, who were then essentially, you know, transmitted with the disease. And that's when, like we've seen before with various humans, even uh, last episode with Cave and Malib going to the senator and, you know, seeing the black goo coming out the head. Those are indeed humans who have been truly infected by this parasite, as they point out, because they're leaking this black brain matter. I also like how Holoris wanted them to see this because, you know, as detailed by the fake Frankie, she wanted Caleb there. But as they point out in the behind the scenes, they love that flies have been an icon of the show from the very beginning. So the fact that there's this creepy idea that Hale would use the flies as the very emissary for her plan of control is just, uh, well, yeah, a very fitting thing considering they've been in the show since season one. This is where Maeve starts hearing these noises and they go to the location where there's, a, where there's this kind of weird device. And it kind of reminds me of like a, a like bees almost to like a, a, a hive, a comb, if you will. And it's potentially on a frequency that Caleb can't hear. 
And I'm wondering if this is what the homeless guy was hearing in where we have Christina slash the new Dolores, if you will, in that world. And those who have been infected by the flies can hear that noise and it's potentially their way. Or should I say this is Hale's way of sending the Wi-Fi signals out and commands to her new human hosts, such as Peter you know, who was stalking Christina, etc, etc. And obviously those ones who we saw on the screen going through this experiment, and one of them which set off alarms was Frankie, which is very sadistic of you, Hale. Obviously it's not the real Frankie, but in this moment as a father, Caleb was like, oh my god, maybe somehow they got to my daughter and my wife. So Caleb rushes after to reach his fake daughter in this moment. We have Maeve trying to hack through using her force ability, granted that this is, again, some code that she's unfamiliar with, so that's why it's taking some time for her to decipher it and crack through it. And luckily for Caleb in this moment at least, he gets through. But it was in this moment that Maeve, I guess with her force Wi-Fi signals picked up that, you know, she can sense something from Frankie. And unlike a human of whom she can't sense something from because they don't have any Wi-Fi signals coming out of them like Caleb, the fact that she could probably with Frankie gave it away that she knew that she was a host and there was something else going on here. But before she could go and warn Caleb, the host in black arrives. And this was a fun little rematch because she does wreck the host in black. She's like, aren't you tired of me kicking your ass? And she does. But I have to assume that was another host in black that came out. Unless he got up from his bullet wounds, maybe Haloris has made multiple versions of them. And whilst all this was going on, it was revealed what the host Frankie was trying to do. Me and Mummy are never the ones that Hale needed anyway. All she needed was you. And this is where she opened up classical host style and a bunch of flies came out and they indeed have gone into Caleb's brain. So I'm going to get onto the promo aspect of this now. And the promo was really super intriguing because you can see that Caleb's brain has, in, well, obviously, as we saw a fly go in, been infected by this parasite. And we see him struggling not to shoot Maeve. You can see Maeve there, and I believe you can see Charlotte Hale, or Holoris, if you will, beside her. And, you know, I, I do wonder how he's going to get out of this. Because you have to think Caleb's not going to be over and done with right now. But we do know that Haloris is doing a bit of trolling to Caleb in the next episode as well because he asked, what did you do to me? She says, what I'm going to do to all of your kind. Again, it is kind of obvious that she wants to basically assert what humans did to hosts with narratives within parks to actual humans. And I'm assuming that in some way or another, maybe Haloris wants Caleb to see her side of things. Because don't forget, this is a deviation of Dolores. This is the last technically surviving right now iteration of Dolores who went down her own path. So I think there's going to be some interesting scenes there next episode. But also, I think she also wants to stop the people who are trying to stop her at the same time. In the promo for next episode as well, we see that the shovel was being used for some digging up. We see Bernard digging, so I guess he knew that the shovel was to be obtained by Stubbs so they could dig up the weapon, potentially. And also, guys, we might get some more answers as well, because I don't think they can continue the Bernard storyline too much without revealing the fates of Caleb and Maeve, and also the identity of C, who is probably Frankie but grown up, because the promo also displays that we could get some more flashback context, or maybe flash forward context, if you will, from where Caleb and Maeve are standing, into that scene of where he's bleeding out, because we see some scenes in the next promo of the little undercover operation of Maeve and Caleb going to blow up the original Rehoboam, which ultimately led to Caleb being wounded. So again, this is what is leading me to believe that maybe, maybe he dies, and that is how Frankie grows up and gets to where she is. And this could all be somewhat revealed, mostly next episode, for maybe some dialogue to happen with Bernard saying, I actually once met your father. And it could be one of those dual parallel scenes that reveal things at the same time. I could be wrong about that. That could be too early for episode four to get into that. But the fact that we're getting promo teasers of their undercover operation, maybe they're only going to spoon feed a little bit to us. But let me know if you think I'm on the right track. And let me know what you think of this episode. I actually really thoroughly enjoyed this one. There was no Christina in this episode. I think they wanted, for example, you bench Christina's park storyline or whatever's going on with her to get in some Bernard and Stubb stuff. But I don't know, guys. I'm enjoying it. I enjoyed this episode. Appreciate a lot of the stuff. Revisiting Westworld in a way, but in the 20s getting some more creepy aspects and insight behind that of the flies, getting into a bit more of a future storyline instead of eight years, maybe, I don't know, 12 to 15, give or take years, with a future Frankie, potentially, 
and what could be going on there, the weapon that could have been hidden by her father before he died. Let's talk about it all down in the comments below, guys. But if you enjoyed this video, let me know by leaving a like on it. I'd really appreciate that. Also, subscribe if you're brand new here. I'm sure not only will you enjoy future Westworld videos, but other content on the channel. But till next week, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day, and I'll see you fellow hosts or humans in the next video. Goodbye.